Hey, welcome to the second session of the China Paradox Seminar Series. My name is Miles Hansen. I'm the president and CEO of World Trade Center Utah. I'm dialing in today from sunny St. George, Utah. For those of you not in Utah, you may know St. George is the gateway to Zions National Park. Zions is one of the top national parks in the entire world. We welcome visitors from all over the world, millions of them every single year. What you may not know is that St. George, Utah is also one of the fastest growing small metropolitan areas in the United States. According to the Milken Institute, they just released a study a couple months ago, and St. George is, uh, is in a top five small city for economic development and economic growth. That's driven by a, a, a exploding tech uh, sector here in the southern part of Utah. And so I encourage you to come out here to St. George at some point, do a little tourism, and get up in our Red Rock Canyons, and then go into St. George to do some business I'm grateful to the St. George Area Chamber of Commerce uh, for, for hosting me today. And Don Willie runs a phenomenal operation, is on the board of World Trade Center Utah. He's the president and CEO of St. George Area Chamber of Commerce. So thank you, Don, for, for having us. Today we're talking about China's economic and trade policy and what it means for U.S. businesses. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, who aren't in Utah, uh, World Trade Center Utah is the state's uh, leader on international business development. We exist to help Utah companies grow globally. We do that by helping companies identify global market opportunities, put together strategies and then execute those strategies to increase international sales. We do that by facilitating international investment here in the state of Utah. And as we're doing that, we have a lot of fun working hard to elevate Utah's status as a global hub for trade, investment and innovation. And so please reach out if you're a Utah company and let us know how we can help you grow. And if you're not in Utah, please reach out so we can connect you to Utah companies. There will be great partners to you so you can participate in the really incredible things happening uh, to Utah's economic economy. We've had a great growth over the past couple of years. And through the pandemic, uh, now we are the top economy in the United States and we're poised to do very, very well in the post-pandemic economy. I'm very grateful to Harris Bricken, phenomenal law firm for sponsoring the China Paradox uh, seminar series. And I encourage you to go to the China Law Blog. It's a phenomenal resource. It's somewhere that, that I read on a regular basis to try to understand the legal and regulatory issues happening in China and to get some good sound business advice. I'm also very grateful to all of our partners in our uh, China Paradox seminar series, including the Orange G. Hatch Foundation, the US China Business Council. We've got Craig here today. We'll hear from him in a few minutes and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce will have uh, Jeremy participating in next week's session as well. For those that didn't see it, I strongly encourage you to go back and watch our first session, which we held last week featuring Ambassador John Huntsman and Matt Pottinger, who was President Trump's Deputy National Security Advisor and the person who had more influence over the past four years on U.S. policy than any other person in the United States. It was a phenomenal session. We've had about 2,000 people who have uh, watched that so far and you can find that at uh, World Trade Center Utah's YouTube channel. And Hannah, we're grateful for all of your work organizing this. If you could put a link in the chat, I think people would be interested in checking that out if they haven't seen it yet. So we've got an incredible conversation. I'm excited to dive in. But before we do that, we're joined here on screen uh, by a good friend and the vice chair of World Trade Center Utah, uh, Mr. Lou Kramer. Lou is the former director general of the Foreign uh, Commercial Service at the Commerce Department and is Mr. International. He's got friends all around the world. We were in Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago. We walked into a small group meeting, seven or eight people, and kid you not, Lou knew at least 25% of them, either first degree or second degree. So Lou, thank you for joining us. I'd like to go ahead and, and pass the baton over to you for some welcoming remarks as we kick this thing off. Thank you, Miles. What a delight to be with you all and to, to see so many good friends. Uh, we are thankful, as, as noted, to our partners and our sponsors, participants, and particularly these wonderful panelists. I ask Miles for the opportunity to say hello to my dear friend, uh, Mr. Ambassador Craig Allen. Uh, I was just computing that uh, I've known Craig for over 36 years when he was an incredibly bright, talented, young presidential management intern. Uh, we worked together at the Commerce Department. I said, I'm buying stock in this man now. And uh, 36 years later, that's been the best investment you know, the United States has made. So greetings. I, I know Matt and Gary are great as well. I, I know your backgrounds, but I do know Craig from all these years, uh, many decades. And we're so, so pleased that you're willing to spend time with us here in Utah. It's a booming economy. We call China, not the Far East, but the near West here in, uh, in the uh, Utah. 
and with your backgrounds of each of you, but particularly my dear friend Craig, welcome so much, and we very much appreciate you spending time with us. And uh, I've seen already on the chat some old friends checking in as well, Craig. So you attract the best kind of crowd. So thank you to all, and welcome to Utah. <laughs> thank you, Lou, very much for that. So now it's my honor to go ahead and introduce today's panelists. And I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes the incredible talent and expertise that we have on the panel today. And so I'm going to take just a minute and, and go a little bit more in depth than I normally would about each of their backgrounds, because it really is incredible. And the breadth of experience and the perspective that we're going to get today is phenomenal. So first off, we have Ambassador Craig Allen, who's the president of the U.S.-China Business Council. Ambassador Allen joined the U.S.-China Business Council after a long and distinguished career in public service. Immediately prior to joining the U.S.-China Business Council, he served as a U.S. Ambassador, ambassador to Brunei, a post he held for nearly four years. And Ambassador, that's a long time to be an ambassador in any country, but I'm sure you were busy, um, but thank you for your service there. Prior to serving as Ambassador to Brunei, he served as the Commerce Department's top official over China, as well as uh, across all of Asia. And he also served as a top trade official at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Throughout his career, he served in many assignments throughout Asia. And I saw in your, uh, your bio, Craig, uh, one stop in South Africa, I think. And so it's nice to know you got out of Asia for at least a little while and had some time down south in, in Africa. The second panel, so go ahead and introduce is Gary Rochelle. Gary is the founding managing partner of Shiming Venture Partners, a firm he launched in 2006 in Shanghai that now has over $5 billion, with a B, in assets under management with a, a very incredible focus on tech and healthcare innovation. Prior to founding uh, Xi Ming, Gary was a senior executive at Intel, at Sequent Computer, Cisco, and SoftBank, and he, uh, including serving on SoftBank's board of directors. Gary is also a member of the China Strategy, Strategy Group and co-authored a report with former Google CEO Eric Schmidt called Asymmetric Competition, a Strategy for China and Technology, and Gary, I want to dig into that report a little bit today. I was reviewing it over the past week and again last night. Phenomenal thought leadership there and, and very important topics that you've identified. And I look forward to getting your perspective on that later in the conversation. Finally, we've got Matt Turpin, who is a good friend of mine and a former colleague from the National Security Council. Matt is a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he's the former National Security Council Director of China Affairs. Matt is also a senior advisor at Palantir Technologies, Prior to serving in the White House, Matt served for 22 years in the U.S. Army in a variety of combat units in the United States, Europe, and across the Middle East. Matt's taught at West Point, and he served as a senior China advisor to the Joint Chiefs. So thank you to each of you for being with us today. You know, I spent a lot of time working uh, around the military and with people in the military. And in the military, uh, there's a concept of the bluff, B-L-U-F, bottom line up front. Uh, we kicked off last week's session with, with this question. I'd like to go ahead and do it today. Um, I want to get each of your bluffs. What are the top two or three takeaways that you think a company should walk away from today's conversation with that's going to help them figure out what to do amidst these, these changing dynamics uh, with China? And so, Gary, I'll go ahead and start with you if that's okay. Uh, what's your bluff for the businesses tuning in today? Oh, I think the... Given all the noise between on U.S.-China relations, most of it quite negative, um, some of it with good reason, by the way, on the U.S. side. Um, I would say the two thing, the two two things I would take away is number one, you have to stay engaged. So if you're a business person today and you're trying to do business in China or you're looking at business in China, this is not the time to pull back. I don't mean hire more people in China. I don't become more dependent upon China. I mean to be engaged, and what that means is two two good examples. At the macro level, look at simply what's happened with trade. So if you look at global exports and imports back in 2000, they were roughly each around $6 trillion. The US, the US was three times the export amount of exports that China had, and the US was importing 1.3 trillion years. China was, was importing $0.23 trillion a year. 2020, it was $18 trillion of global trade. The U.S. was 1.4 trillion of exports. China was 2.6. So China went up over 10 times during that 20 year period. The U.S. increased by about 2X. On the import side, China went from 0.23 to 2.1 trillion. But the U.S. 
component of that 2.1 trillion is only $135 billion. So when I look at what, you know, there is still a huge opportunity to participate in the growth of China. And because again, when you look forward to 2050, you look at WTO, Goldman numbers, $60 trillion will be the global trade amount. China's export share of that will be 12 out of 60. They'll have to be roughly 20% of global exports. There'll be 10 of 60 or 17% of global imports. The US will be dramatically smaller just as the economies you know, mutually scale up. And so that's not an opportunity if you're a business person that you wanna set aside. Now, how you go about doing that has changed dramatically from what it was 20 years ago. The relationship is more complex with China. Um, I think the regulatory environment in both countries, both governments are setting up different kind of regulatory regimes that you would have had to before. Um, the Biden administration, I think appropriately has taken a very strategic look at supply chains. You have executive orders coming out about supply chains. You're gonna have six um, sectors that are gonna go through thorough review over the next, after, over the next uh, few months. You have to be part of that process. So identify the opportunity, but you have to be part of the process in terms of what is the appropriate regulatory regime for your business, your company, um, you know, in you know, vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I also think that just strategically, being part of that process will also let you know how serious different forms of that regulatory regime will be, either from the Chinese side or the US side. We're not gonna change China, except and, and that's, the, that's kind of the common theme. I would just highlight one thing from my world, the venture capital world in the last 20 years. Basically, up until 2018, almost 75% of the risk capital available in China came from overseas. So we had a profound impact in terms of how China's innovation economy evolved. We may not like some of the directions it took, and I think that that's a, that's a, a good, healthy discussion. But it's a terrible mistake to assume that by engaging and being participant in trade and business that you don't have a, an impact, sometimes quite a material impact of the behavior of the country you're doing business with. So I'll stop there. That's great, Gary, thank you very much for that. Lots of good stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to diving a bit deeper here in a couple minutes. Matt, let's go, to, go ahead and, and go to you. What's your bluff for the companies tuning in today? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would have kind of three up front. Um, and of course, I, I kind of come at this from uh, sort of my perspective uh, in government and then sort of as, as sort of a, a student of watching these things, which, you know, as I look at my, my two colleagues on this panel, um, I am by far uh, the least experienced on these things. And so I, I, I also am keen to hear what they've got to say. Um, but, you know, so if I were to sort of start off with sort of my three sort of top, top issues, you know, one, the... The strategic approach to the to the PRC, from a U.S. perspective, is is changing, right? And I think that's that's yeah, you know, that that's I think anyone can kind of see that from from a from a sort of strategic paradigm of of economic engagement and 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 economic development leading to political political liberalization as a as an overall strategy that the United States was employing with regards to the PRC. And that's changing to a, a strategy or a strategic approach around competition and viewing the PRC as a competitor, as a rival um, in, a, in a geopolitical sense, right? So that, that'd, be the, that'd be the first point I would sort of lay out, that that, that is the, the, the dynamic that's likely sort of unfolding as, as we're watching this. And it's going through a period of sort of paradigm change, right? And I, I believe that this paradigm began to shift around 2014, 2015, and, and we're seeing this, this happen. The second one would be that, that the US and the PRC won't completely decouple, right? That, that, that the PRC and the United States aren't going away, right? That there are important economic and commercial uh, connections and interactions between the, two, between the two countries, but that both Beijing and Washington are now looking at those interdependencies through, increased, through an increased lens of, of vulnerabilities and the ability to use those interdependencies as opportunities to achieve other objectives, right? That, that's certainly a viewpoint from, from the US side. And I think it's, it's equally apparent that that's a viewpoint from Beijing's side, right? And so that, that, that idea of sort of managed competition 
and, and to a certain degree, managed decoupling is likely to unfold. And so that brings me to my third point. You know, what do business leaders need to take away from this? Um, so, so the future is probably unlikely to look like the past, right? That, that the, the experience from, you know, the early 1990s to sort of where we were about five years ago reflected sort of a, a broad strategic approach by the United States to really favor economic engagement to drive those kinds of political liberalizations that, that the United States wanted to see. And you know, and proof of that is that, you know, that this was a, a, a deeply bipartisan sort of position. You know, it's, it's areas that, that President Clinton agreed on. It's, it's areas that President you know, George W. Bush agreed on. It's, it's, it's areas that, that were largely a part of the, 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 the conversation, right? That that was the approach. Given that those things are changing, right? That we are moving to an approach of, of strategic competition, many of the assumptions that business leaders made during that period of time, right? And the business models they created may not be fit to purpose in the, the future of the relationship, right? That doesn't mean that they all end. That doesn't mean that, that, that they go away. It simply means that they're quite different. And that, and you know, to sort of build on Gary's point, you know, now is a time to pay attention. Now is the time to go back and look at, at, at basic assumptions. Uh, and now is the time to look, you know, you know, critically about what the business model is and does this work given the changes that are going on. And that means participating and paying attention, um, you know, and, and to give you a plug, Miles, tuning into things like this, right? You know, seeing where things are going so that you can kind of know what's going on. Now is not the time to sort of be asleep, you know, at the wheel and let things unfold, you know, as they might. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Ambassador Allen, over to you. What's your bluff coming tuning in? Firstly, let me say that I love uh, the title of this series, uh, The China Paradox. As Orville Schell uh, uh, has said, anyone who studies China must enjoy a good paradox. And uh, I think that that is uh, very true. Let me uh, thank you, Miles, and uh, acknowledge my old friend, Lou Kramer, and a few other old friends uh, on the line here. Um, as Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics is local. So let me say a, a couple of things about Utah. Uh, Utah, uh, last year, China was your sixth largest export market. And uh, you exported $574 million worth of goods to China. But that's down uh, from 1.4 uh, uh, billion in uh, 2013. So Utah exports to China have declined by about uh, two thirds uh, over the last seven years. And uh, that has had economic consequences. Over the last year, we estimate about a thousand jobs lost in Utah as a result. Now, maybe those people have moved on to do other work and maybe it's not a problem, but certainly over the last seven or eight years, you've lost uh, several thousand jobs. And uh, I think that uh, that's probably important um, uh, to uh, note. Um, the second thing um, is that your service uh, economy, travel and tourism for China is holding up very well. Uh, so while goods exports have declined, service exports uh, have uh, increased. Uh, clearly, Utah is a very attractive destination uh, for uh, Chinese um, uh, uh, students, uh, travelers, uh, and uh, probably uh, investors uh, as well. Um, the third uh, point uh, I would like to make is, is that, um, and I think that Gary is probably the world's leading um, practitioner here, but China is going to provide 30% of the, uh, global economic growth uh, over the next 10 years. And so therefore, conversations like this are really useful. Uh, I think Matt put it very well to determine an appropriate strategy in a rapidly changing landscape. Uh, absolutely true. Um, uh, but China is going to be a major part uh, and indeed a more important part of the global economy. And so I think it's very worthwhile uh, to sit down and look at uh, how Utah companies, uh, workers, farmers, and ranchers uh, can make uh, best use of uh, China's economic growth. Uh, how can we grow uh, employment in Utah uh, based on China's growth? 
And if the US China Business Council could uh, lend a hand there, nothing would give me greater pleasure. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ambassador Allen, for that. And you're exactly right. China continues to be an important market for Utah. I think a couple of things could be driving some of those, those declines. One, um, uh, increasing trade with Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is a gateway into China. But the tourism is an important part of our relationship with China. As I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the window in front of me, and I can see the, the Red Rock out there. And it, it, when we're not in a pandemic, you know, there are uh, tens of thousands of Chinese tourists, if not more, coming to Utah every year. And it is an important part of our economy. So if we look at this, it's interesting that, that each of you touched on the fact that there are these seismic shifts happening in the relationship. Um, in, in, in Ambassador Allen, maybe I'll, I'll go back to, to you because you've been in the trenches in this U.S.-China economic relationship for a long time. Could you talk for a minute about what the objectives were in, in, in kind of your perspective on the U.S.-China relationship for the first, we call it 35, 40 years? And then what were the what were the U.S. goals then? And then what's been different over the past four or five years? Why do we start to see the significant change happening and this reassessment that people are doing uh, across the country and, and around the world to try to figure out what's happening, why, and what do they do about it? So it's a big question. Um, but what I would say from the business perspective is that uh, actually not that much has changed, uh, really. Uh, business people want to sell stuff. Uh, uh, and China uh, has 20% of the world's population, 30% of the world's growth. And so business people want to uh, take advantage of that. Now, what has changed uh, is that uh, China's gone from uh, $192 per capita per year uh, to about $14,000 per capita per year. So there's been phenomenal uh, growth uh, there. Um, when the U.S. Uh, and China started out this relationship some 50 years ago, we were st strategic allies against the Soviet Union. Uh, now, uh, China is a competitor. Uh, I would fully agree with Matt's uh, uh, interpretation there. Um, and uh, China is particularly a competitor in tech. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's true across the board in tech. Uh, be it life sciences, as, as Gary knows very well, or telecom or aerospace or uh, nano or uh, quantum AI. Um, and, and so we need to work on the rules of the road uh, uh, for technology competition, technology cooperation. And the more difficult question is, how do you enforce those rules? And, and right now, um, uh, we're, we're working on that and we don't have an answer. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Ambassador Allen. You know, Matt, you've spent the past uh, few years uh, in the trenches as well, and, and you've seen some of these, these, these challenges that are becoming really, really persistent and important and systemic. And it does seem like there are some significant changes happening in the relationship. I remember when I first came to Utah, left the White House and came to Utah, I guess two and a half years and now, that was in the middle of the, the trade dispute or the trade war. Right. And there were a lot of companies that I interacted with that felt like, OK, we've got uh, it's, you know, the United States is getting much more aggressive on trade policy. You've got this trade dispute, this trade war. If we can just get a trade deal, things will go back to the way they were before. And what I think we're experiencing is that's simply not true, that there have been these, these seismic changes. There's no going back to the way it was before. Could you show your perspective, Matt, on on why that is and then perhaps you know, what that means for companies is, as you put it in your opening remarks, Matt, that need to take a, a reassess what their strategies are in China moving forward. Yeah, Miles. So, so I, you know, I think from the get go, um, you know, there are expectations about for, for U.S. companies about market access into the PRC, right? You know, you know Craig's points about, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the, the availability of, 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 of money to be able to spend by, by Chinese citizens, um, you know Gary's point about, you know that that we haven't seen a, a commensurate rise in what sort of U.S. exports into the PRC would 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 reach, and to me this started to come to a head, um, <clears throat> sort of late 2015 uh, into into early 2016, as we were approaching essentially that 15 year mark of China's entry into the WTO. 
and and if and if folks will sort of re, you know rewind back to that that period of time that that you know that seems so long ago, but but um, wasn't that long ago, um, you know there was an expectation over that period of time that sort of fifteen year entry in which the PRC we we understood that when the PRC entered the WTO they weren't yet quite yet a market economy, and therefore we had made a, a series of sort of exceptions about China's entry, but, but, but largely we and, 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 and our friends in Europe and, and our friends in Japan and, and, and other places around the world, uh, you know, sort of set those rules aside and said, you know, it actually is in our interest to bring and socialize the PRC into this system. And then they will clearly institute those protections because it's in their interest to do so. That, that it's, it's fundamentally a win-win for everyone if the PRC observes these sorts of rules of the road and becomes sort of a normative actor in economic, commercial, and industrial activity. And I think part of the frustration is we reached that sort of 15 year mark and we were finding that in fact, the PRC was not a market economy. And that, that, that those sort of, that, that the hopes of what we might achieve upon the PRC's entry, right? And the kinds of, of market access that we thought we would be able to do and sort of the comparative advantages that each of each country would be trading off with one another, and that you'd have sort of a positive sort of outcome. The hopes were dashed, um, and and I think there was a lot of disappointment through the U.S. business community, and you know this was reflected through a series of reports by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the European Chamber of Commerce, you know that get get published in sort of early 2017, really around Made in China 2025, and the language around Made in China 2025, which was essentially. That, that the PRC would do to high value manufacturing what they had just spent the last 15 years doing to low value manufacturing. And that the, the, the net losers would be those economies that had specialized in high value manufacturing and would be replaced through localization inside the PRC. And I think that, that sort of just started to sink in and there, there started to be sort of a, a loss of, of, of kind of faith and, 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 and expectations of what folks would be able to achieve. And that created the conditions for an overall reevaluation. And that got married up with sort of the backward sliding in, 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 in political openness um, and sort of access to information that we were seeing. I'll remind everyone, I mean, you know, James Fallows wrote, I thought an excellent piece in the Atlantic uh, in December of 2016, right? You know, he'd clearly written it before the election, but about China's great side backwards or great leap backwards, essentially the, the unwinding of much of the progress that we had seen. And that created, I think, was a sort of a mindset of where folks were, that, that this wasn't sort of a level playing field and that we needed to resolve that. And that as we went into those negotiations, we were essentially negotiating the same thing we've been negotiating since, well, I mean, in many cases, since you know, George H.W. Bush you know, began a Section 301 investigation back in 1990 to get for sort of enforcement for intellectual property, market access, all those sorts of things that we had had way back then. And we were still essentially negotiating the same issues. And I think that, that just resulted in a degree of, of frustration that things were not moving in the direction that we thought. Great. Thank you, Matt. And it, it's interesting, uh, as you referenced uh, James' article from December 2016, I literally have that up on my screen, one tap over from this call. So I've posted a link in the chat function. But I think it's, it's I, I love that article and, and I, I read it for the first time about a week and a half ago because it provides a snapshot, this moment in time prior to the Trump administration. And if President Trump, love him or hate him, you know, he's got a unique way of engaging uh, on policy issues. And I think that there was this misperception among many that the, the, the contention in these changes were a result of the Trump administration and President Trump's priorities and style. But James's article in December of 2016 provides this window into the nature of the relationship and to show that these shifts had occurred prior to President Trump coming into office. And President Trump then was, was responding. And, it, and my guess is that while the style is unquestionably unique and different, the substance of the policy would have been very similar no matter who won the election in 2016. Just like we're seeing, it's very similar uh, no matter who won uh, in the most recent presidential election. So I'd encourage people to, to check that out. Okay, Gary, you have found tremendous commercial success 
investing in China, pooling capital, helping China's technology, tech ecosystem grow and succeed. I'd be curious for your take. As you look at from when you launched I, um, the fund in 2006 until now, what changes do you perceive that have occurred in China? And then what do you think that means for, for U.S. businesses? Well, I think the... The big changes, and we got to, we were able to see it because we invest so early in underlying technologies. So for a long time, as as Matt and Ambassador Allen know well, 2005, 2014, the conventional wisdom was China can't innovate; that all it's doing is copying what's happened in the United States. And you know, in fact, President Biden said, "Well, there's nothing innovative coming out of China." And fortunately, I think we caught that misconception and start to start to address it before it became fatal. Um, when you look at just some statistics back in 2005, there was exactly one new novel compound developed by a Chinese company in the pharmaceutical industry. Last year, there were about 380. And so what you start to look at is, yes, there was some great misappropriation of intellectual property. There was some great, it's just some terrible behavior in, in the corporate world, but at the same time, the underlying energy in China came from the private sector, not the state sector. The vast majority of new hires, over 100% of new employment in the last 20 years has come from private companies. Uh, the vast majority of profit growth has come from private companies. There are now significantly close to 70% of the overall economy is in private companies. These are fundamental changes that were missed by a lot of folks that were simply doing business, the normal course of business. So now given that, you have to take a step back and say, as, as both uh, you know, Matt and, and Ambassador Allen have said, the environment has changed, the context has changed. So what's the competitive environment now? It's no longer spending all of your time trying to find the closest relative to someone in the Ministry of Finance. That's really not the winning strategy right now for China. The winning strategy is who are the people in the working groups on the regulatory environment that are doing the same job that their counterparts in the US are doing trying to get ahead of where technology is taking them. Governments, our own maybe being a, maybe being a bad example, maybe being a, the worst example, really have not been leading indicators on technology. Yeah. We've really been trailing indicators and a great deal of the policy has been trying to catch up with what's already happened in the marketplace. And I think that you should, you, the reason you need to be engaged in China on the ground and be very actively engaged with your business partners, distributors, whoever your, your, uh, the other components of your supply chain are in China, is you're going to learn the cutting edge of what's happening there from them before you're going to hear it from Beijing. And I always view the Chinese government, they get great credit for, well, they have this policy and that policy. It's a trailing indicator. Please don't, I mean, made in China 2025, what it does is it sets bumpers so that the private enterprise is, they know what not to do, but they don't tell them what to do. And what we, as, what we as foreigners doing business in China need to understand is those are guideposts. You probably shouldn't violate the guideposts because then you're really, then you're assuming you know something that the Chinese government does, doesn't know. And that's always dangerous, with, for, especially for within China. But at the same time, don't, don't, don't wait for them to tell you what to do. And I think the most successful private companies in China have been very innovative and have really jumped ahead of what the government thought they could do. The government ultimately will now, but as it is in the U.S. in terms of some of the law, some of the regulatory uh, oversight coming into tech, it's coming in China, it's coming in the U.S. But again, these are trailing indicators based upon how powerful those companies became. They didn't become powerful because the Chinese government told Alibaba, go do finance or they didn't tell Tencent, go do WeChat. You I mean, these, these occurred because there's this cauldron of entrepreneurial energy in China. And you have to, as a business person, you have to figure out how to tap into that. That's the single most important constituent you have to deal with when you're dealing with China. That's fantastic, Gary. I really appreciate that perspective. Um, one quick follow-up, and then I, I do want to take a couple minutes to talk about your report. It's fascinating to me, uh, in our conversation last week, you could tell that Ambassador Huntsman and, and Matt Pottinger viewed the problem very similarly. 
in terms of uh, of these shifting uh, this relationship from being a, a a partner a country that we wanted to try to help develop economically now to this geopolitical rival and competitor um ambassador Hansman has written that you know china is working to uh make the world safe for their system which comes at inherent costs and risks to our system and, and our values as well so you've got this this competition happening ambassador Hansman uh, talked a lot about the confidence we should have in our system where we do have free and open markets where we are you know our success as a country for for centuries has been this innovative entrepreneurial spirit that is manifest uh that is made possible through this free and open system that we have and gary one thing that i hadn't thought about is you talked about this cauldron of innovation that's happening in the private sector in china i'd be curious for your take how does that impact uh china's chinese governance going forward is the the system they have right now where you the, this mercantilist system where they you've got some free and open aspects of the economy other aspects are, are very controlled but can you continue to have this innovation uh a, can the innovation continue at the same pace and rate within this system or does that cauldron end up impacting and influencing the overall system so great question um everyone who's assumed that it couldn't continue has been wrong. So yeah. in the spirit of potentially taking a slight detour into a, a dangerous path, I would offer that there's a big difference between innovation and invention. So invention requires, I think, a far more collaborative, integrated uh, environment than innovation. Innovation can be addressed by looking at a market opportunity and modifying something to address that. I think when you look at invention, and you could pick any one, the invention of the semiconductor, the invention of entirely new uh, you know, underlying technologies for things, the invention of the uh, software as a service model. Invention requires more trust. So I think Ambassador Huntsman, I would never publicly want to disagree with Ambassador Huntsman. So you know, I, would, I would completely agree that we should have more confidence in our system. Our system is trust-based. Everything in the United States government, the political system, the financial system, it's come under stress, but it is trust-based. China is a low trust environment. So the more complicated the task, the more integrated the task or the more integration of technology and people the task requires, I think it plays to the US benefit. Multilateral relations play to the US's benefit. We should quit, we should quit hiding from our own strengths. And I think that this is something that's really fundamental um, what you're going to find is the Chinese entrepreneurs are not going to sit still. So again, you have to operate at the speed that the Chinese entrepreneurs operate at. And I used to laugh when I was in Silicon Valley, you'd go to China and everyone in Silicon Valley thought how fast paced it was compared to Shanghai in 2006, it was sleepy. And I think just fundamentally, there was just an energy and an enthusiasm that's not going to go away. So the goal is, how do you tap into that? Because you want, you want some of that juice. And that juice can help you not only in China, but can help you in a lot of other aspects of your global business. Yep, that's fantastic. Thank you for that, Gary. Ambassador Allen, you've got such long perspective and experience working in China. What's your take uh, on that question? As you see that this cauldron of innovation is happening, how does that influence China over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and, and what does that mean for, for the U.S. economy and our trade policy and our economic engagement? So um, thank you very much. We have underestimated the Chinese for um, 40 years, and I think it's a good time to stop doing making that mistake. Uh, the Chinese uh, graduate annually about 1.8 million STEM workers compared to 650,000 in the United States. The Chinese have about 25 percent of the world's total uh, STEM workforce, uh, and therefore uh, they are uh, likely going to be very, very uh, innovative in the future. Um, as uh, Gary highlighted, uh, most of this, all of it, uh, is coming out of the private sector uh, in China. Uh, the government is adding uh, um, uh, gasoline uh, to that fire, um, definitely, and in many ways that are uh, violate the WTO. I have argued to China's top leadership that uh, the Made in China 2025 program violates every chapter of the WTO. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, I don't think we should expect that to change. Um, the names might change, but the approach uh, probably will not. But uh, that innovation, uh, in my view, is going to uh, continue to strengthen. Um, it is not going to lose uh, steam. Uh, and uh, it is going to create new paradigms uh, against where we're going to have to compete. The age of catch up is over. Uh, the age of innovation is here. And Silicon Valley, Shenzhen, Hangzhou, uh, Beijing are all going to be contributing to that. How we contribute it and the nexus between the two countries, that is very, very much up for debate. And, and I think that it requires very careful thought. Thank you. Yep, that's great. Thank you, Ambassador Allen. And Matt, curious for your take. So last week, Matt Pottinger said, the reason why China wants this strategy of making the world dependent on China and a China not dependent on the world is in order to have coercive leverage in the form of economic leverage to pursue political aims around the world. And so I'd be curious, given this, the, the fact that, that we're not in the, the realm of catch up anymore, but now we're in a we're in a foot race in, in a lot of different ways. Leverage is very important. Uh, China has demonstrated that it's willing to use its leverage and its coercive abilities through this economic e relationship um, to pursue its political objectives around the world. Australia right now is a prime example. If you're a wine cell in Australia, uh, you're going through a really, really, really tough time as you become collateral damage in this geopolitical spat, right? As we look forward, uh, looking at how things went in Alaska last week, you know, we're probably going to have some similar dynamics with the United States as we move forward. So this idea of leverage becomes very, very important in coercion and the companies understanding where they're exposed and what they're doing now before they're in a crisis to invest some of their, their profits out of China for this escape hatch, right? You, you gotta have a parachute on your back. And if you were a wine uh, producer in Australia, you know what would you have done five or seven years ago to prepare for this crisis they find themselves in now today? So Matt, I'd be curious for your advice for companies, how should they be thinking through co uh, coercion and leverage? And, and what can they be doing now to prepare for what in some industries at some point is likely uh, inevitable given the nature of the, the relationship between the United States and China and the tenor and tone of our diplomatic engagements right now? Yeah, I mean, I'd start with that, that you know, every sector to a certain degree is somewhat different. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was talking with, with some Australian colleagues in both the, you know, South Australia, as well as at Queensland and, and my colleagues in South Australia, you know, where the majority of that wine would come from, you know, were, you know, you know, feeling significant pain and feeling that they were a part of that, uh, you know, fully targeted yet the Queensland colleagues, that sell seafood, you know, we're seeing a massive uptick in seafood being bought from by the PRC, you know, in, in them. So, so I think it's it's important to keep in mind that that you know, how this unfolds, you know, is actually highly dependent upon the sector, right? And so, you know, this is where you know, going from the headlines of what's going on into the how this is actually operationally being, uh, you know, uh, put into practice is incredibly important. Um, there are, of course, going to be sectors that maybe in the past we thought were, were, were relatively benign and, and increasingly, or we now have, have understood, are, are areas of, of deep competition, right? And in that case, um, you know, thinking about what those exposures are, uh, you know, uh, diversifying yourself and your your supply chain and your customer you know, your client base as a way to prevent uh, or to deter retaliation right that if you've if you've if you can make a product in in more than one location outside the PRC right the likelihood that that coercion will be brought against that manufacturer right who could okay well then I guess I'm just not going to have jobs there in the PRC I will ramp up production in this other location it makes it a much less attractive target of that retaliation or coercion. Um, so I think you're know, thinking that through. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I think where we're at right now is we need you know, really 
we need to move from the headlines to a much more detailed investigation of sort of by sector, what areas are, are really sort of sensitive and strategic? What areas do, do both sides have an interest in continuing? And what, what sectors are going to be used for you know, political leverage? Um, you know, I mean, there are plenty of, of farmers in the United States who didn't think that, that their products were particularly strategic, except when viewed through a political lens, they became a strategic commodity. And I think we, we all have to be sort of sophisticated about that. We now have to sort of realize that, that those things are in play and those things will be in play into the future. Um, and and it, 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 it begs for, you know, I think a theme that's, that's come along here, you know, we can certainly hope that our government will, will persuade the PRC to change its behavior. The track record of that is not all that good. Or we could focus on changing our own behavior for the conditions that we're in. At which, which point in time, if you look at it in that perspective, you know, we, have, we have things we can do and we have things that we can focus on. Um, and then, and then you know, a rivalry and a competition plays out based upon sort of who can perform better. Um, and in many cases, that will be mutually beneficial to both sides as, as they sort of compete with one another to get better. And we test for the world how these systems stand up to these things. I'm, I'm personally quite confident in the system we have if we uh, you know, openly sort of understand that we're in a competition and don't believe that it's, it doesn't exist. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great point. And, and I would add, you know, four or five years ago, nobody probably would have, would have thought, you know, wine uh, exports from Australia to China would be an issue that would become so important. And so I think on a national level, we have to think through different industries. And you're exactly right. There's a different industry approach and the sensitivities and challenges and nature of the competition across different industries very significantly. But at a company level, I think that it's critical that, you know, this case is, is wine from Australia several years ago. It was salmon from Norway, uh, soybeans from the Midwest. Right. So at a company level, you don't know for sure, no matter what you're producing or selling to China, what could come in the future Dan Harris is a good friend. He's a partner at Harris Brickin, a contributor to the China Law Blog. And I wrote a post from Dan, it's probably been nine months ago or so, where he talked about escape routes. And he talked about experiences that he had back in the wild days of Vladivostok in, in Siberia, uh, working there shortly after, after the fall of the Soviet Union, and how they had to always plan what the escape would be if they ran into trouble. And he tells a great story about when that happened. And then he likens that to companies where if for any company in any, in any industry, if China is a significant market for you on the sell side or on the supply chain and the sourcing side, you need to think through your escape route. And if something happened to your industry that wasn't driven by business, but it was driven by geopolitics, what are you doing now to prepare for that? And how do you make sure that you're in a well good position where if everything got shut off in China, you could adapt if necessary and I promise it's, it's like buying, you know, in, uh, home insurance. You don't need it till your house burns down, right? This is an investment in insurance that's going to help you be prepared if something happens on the geopolitical level that impacts your business. And Matt, thinking about the different uh, sectors, obviously technology is critical. Uh, Gary, I've been teasing it now for a few minutes. Oh, sorry, Matt, you want to jump in real quick? So, so I, I, I fully understand the, the sort of the tendency to look at the risks. Right, and to sort of focus on those. That's a, that's a very human tendency. But I think we should also look at, and I would encourage business leaders to look at the opportunities, right? So, you know, when change happens, there are always sort of winners and losers, right? And there are new sort of business models that become, you know, acceptable that didn't seem to work in the, in the last way. And so, yeah, you know, while we, while we maybe rightly focus upon the risks and, and, and mitigating and, and, and being cautious, the, the shift that we're seeing likely also presents opportunities, right? Now, those opportunities might not be solely in a US PRC context, but, you know, there are, you know, over 6 billion other people on the planet too. And there might be other places that it would make sense and that we should probably think about that as well. Um, and that, you know, we've had two decades of sort of hyper concentration of manufacturing inside the PRC, that 
that might not continue forever, right? It, it, is, it is a function of the, condi- of the sort of the political conditions and economic conditions that we found ourselves in at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. There's no guarantee that, that those conditions then remain the same and that there might not be other opportunities in other places where we probably need to spend more time and energy. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great comment. Thank you, Matt. Okay, Gary, let's talk a little bit about this report. I'm uh, trying to post a link to it here in, in the chat. There we go. Phenomenal job. Uh, the thought leadership that went into this thing is fantastic. Again, the report is called Asymmetric Competition, a Strategy for China and Technology. And I think this is required reading for anybody that's involved with technology or anybody that is looking at this from a macro perspective in terms of how uh, our economies engage. You know, when I first read the title Asymmetric, you know, that brought me back to my days working in the Middle East. If you thought about warfare in the Middle East. And so I, I, I was interested to find out why uh, it was deemed asymmetric competition. Uh, as I reviewed it, it, it seems to be that China plays by a different set of rules um, and they benefited from corporate espionage, illiberal surveillance, and this blurry line between uh, public and private sector. And so that's why it's a, a term asymmetric, is that China's operating from this different set of rules that are distinct and different from, and in some ways uh, undermine the set of rules that have, have worked so well for us here in the United States. In the report, it talks about how we're trending towards a bifurcation of tech spheres. And it also says that that, that may be preferable. And that maybe this is what you're talking about in terms of opportunity, but maybe if this is the trend we're going in, Maybe there's some preferences or some opportunity there. So Gary, I'd be curious to see your take is, is somebody who, who worked with many others on the report. And as somebody, I, I, I've, I've co-authored a report with large groups before. And so I know that things make it in the final version that I don't necessarily agree with. And so uh, not sure if, if that may be the case here with you, but what are some of your takeaways from that effort, uh, from your deep dive into how US technology should move forward in, in our engagement with China in, in the years to come? Well, a lot of the, um, the, the, the best thing about the team, there were 13, 13, 14 of us, and we worked for 12 weeks. No one ever missed a meeting. So that was a commitment. That was a, a sign of the commitment of the, of, of the group to the, uh, to the energy. And I think four are now in the administration. So they did have people in there that were, that were kind of interesting in terms of where they wound up with uh, in the Biden administration. Setting that aside, to me, the real takeaway, as you were talking about the asymmetric side, there was another big piece of it, which is the idea of what does capitalism look like in China, or what is the what's it, it's a market economy, but it's a more heavily managed market economy. And what we tried to get down to was why would Chinese firms have an advantage? And it's not because the government tells them what to do; it's because the government gives them time. And so the market restrictions on foreign technologies in China, the market restriction, you know, the, the way that they play favorites, the way that they provide access to domestic, some domestic uh, technology over foreign technology, all that does is it gives the entrepreneurs time. And the entrepreneurs, given the speed that they're cycling on various innovations, they catch up pretty quick. You know, that was the point that Ambassador Allen was making earlier. You know, they're going to catch up, catch up pretty quick. They just need a little bit of a leg up. So. When you're competing with that, the U.S. government is not going to do that. The U.S. government is not, we're not going to be into a situation where we're going to start picking winners in technology. But we have to get, we have to get to the point where our infrastructure and our ecosystem can operate at the same speed. Now, that's, you, you run into another issue, which Matt was alluding to, which is another big part of the takeaway for me with working with this group is, the best way for the U.S. to compete is to make the rest of the world better. So there's 1.4 billion people in China. There's 350 million, 340 million in the United States. There's another five and a half, six billion out there. If we reduce the gap, so China's reducing the gap with the U.S., if you will. If we reduce the gap between China and everyone else, we win. Because fundamentally, it's our ability to help the rest of the world catch up that I think is fundamental to our values. I think it's fundamental to how other countries would like to see the United States lead in various areas. So one of the big takeaways was again, look at yourself and figure out the race you're in, figure out what's the competition gonna be like, what do you have to do to get in shape for that? And so they, those were some of my 
kind of under the line takeaways that may not have been, you know, specifically, you know, published in the report. But I do think the, I do think that the idea that we need to pick areas of technology where the platforms are so important, we can't afford to fail. We can't afford to be behind. Maybe it's parity in some cases, it's leadership in others. You can look at gene therapy, you could look at the rules of the road for AI. So you're going you're gonna to have to establish some areas where you say, we just simply can't afford to get behind in this area. And so one of the next follow-on follow -on, uh, pieces of that report is really defining those areas and going much deeper in, in uh, some of those categories. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Gary. Ambassador Allen, I know that we, uh, you've got to run here real quick. We're out of time. This hour has gone by so fast. I could do this all day long. So Ambassador Allen, why don't you go ahead and, and, and give us the last word on today's session? Okay, well, I think that Matt uh, and Gary uh, have uh, brought out some very important truths. And the, the, the way that I would like to frame that is that we mustn't be obsessed on the bilateral. Rather, we could address the bilateral through the multilateral and the regional. Um, and uh, working on that overall context, making this uh, Asia in particular, from a bilateral problem to a multilateral issue where the US has strong relationships with all the other major players in the region uh, is an appropriate uh, uh, way to go forward. Uh, and it will help to constrain uh, Chinese behavior uh, uh, when, when Chinese behavior needs to be constrained. So I think that those are powerful truths uh, that uh, we could work on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Allen. And, and thank you for everybody for participating with us today. And a huge thank to our panelists. If we were here all here in person, we'd be like applauding you and, and telling you how great you are. Uh, but this has been a phenomenal conversation. You know, just as we wrap this up, Ambassador Allen, thank you for that, that final point. You know, in my mind, on terms of hard power, right, China is going to surpass the United States economically in terms of military might in the coming years and decades. That's going to happen. So if, if we reduce this competition to one of simply hard power, we're going to be in a pretty tough spot. Where the United States is winning and will always win by virtue of our system is our soft power. This idea that our companies are, are, are these people to people ties, the fact that people all around the world want to work with the United States and, and be a partner with the United States that is a competition that we win every single time. And it's absolutely essential that we frame our and China engagement as a nation, thinking through the preponderance of power that we have within the soft realm. And we're still pretty good on the hard power stuff too. And if we work with our partners and allies, that's how we keep the world safe for our system and this free and open uh, system of our economy in, 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 in uh, political system that has done so much good for people all around the world and brought the world uh, from extreme poverty into a place where far more people are prosperous today. Thanks to the leadership in this rules-based international system the United States helped form and has led for the past 75 or 80 years. And so that's absolutely essential for us to think through as a nation. And then as individual companies, you know, last week Ambassador Huntsman talked about companies engaging and making sure that they protect their values and, and are representing their values and really underscored the opportunity that we have to shape things in China through that type of engagement. Um, so I encourage everybody to continue to engage. Thank you again for everybody for participating today. I try to steer the question based off some of the, the, the conversation based on questions that came into the chat. I apologize we didn't get through everything. We will review those and use those to tee up the conversation, um, not next week, but the week after. Our uh, last session will be April 7th. Then that session, we're gonna dive deep to provide actionable advice about what US companies should do. We danced around that a little bit today, but we're gonna have some great experts, uh, Bill Zarek, Tim Stratford, uh, Jeremy Waterman from the US Chamber, uh, Jonathan Bench, who's a lawyer at Harris Brick and is gonna help moderate that session. But that's where we're gonna try to dive deep. And so please let us know if you have questions or topics you want us to go deep on. We'll go ahead and do that next week. And until then, I hope everybody has a great day and a great week. And I'm gonna go out and enjoy some time down here in Southern Utah. Thanks all, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks guys. Take care.